Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. Some new faces as well. That's wonderful. So as usual, we are live streaming on YouTube. Just want to make sure everybody uh, knows that. And I think, Ashton, are you going to lead us in with a few opening comments? And then I think we wanted to do some very brief introductions. It's a large group, but it'd be great to just get a sense for who's here and what brought you here. We'll be spending, I think, something like 20 weeks together to get through this book. So it'll be quite a uh, fellowship that we develop over those many months. We've done this with several other books, and it's really a rewarding experience to explore these ideas, to cultivate uh, this opportunity for spiritual scientific research together. So Ashton, do you want to offer some opening comments? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's great to see such a large group and to see so many familiar faces. Um, yeah. So I just have some preliminary thoughts based on the introduction by Matthew Barton and the prefaces. Uh, so we're reading what edition is this? Up to, yeah, 1925 preface. And I just, I really appreciated uh, this use of the term macroscope uh, that Barton used in his introduction uh, to describe Steiner's vision. And, and when he says, uh, Steiner emphasizes that our scientific instrument in this case um, is ourselves. So of course that's what Steiner is always emphasizing that in order to know higher worlds or super sensible realities, we have to cultivate the instrument of our humanity. And, and he also writes in one of the prefaces, Steiner, uh, that I wrote in such a way as to make it necessary to exert one's thinking while entering into the content of the of these books. Um, and so I, I think of this also in comparison to, and, and for those who are familiar with the anthroposophy, this won't be anything new to you, but for those who are new to Steiner, uh, I, I think the way that he thought about reading texts like this, esoteric science or the philosophy of freedom is more in continuity with how uh, people thought about what reading entailed or what was happening in spiritual reading uh, prior to modernity. So reading as a kind of participation in spiritual realities and, and to think about, so just these opening thoughts are just, I guess, kind of more regarding like his method and, and how we might think about and how probably many of you already think about entering into a text like this, um, thinking about language rather than just a means of communicating information as a conduit uh, of, for participating in super sensible realities. That's that's at least the invitation. I'm not saying that everything, uh, you know, that, that what's being offered here is necessarily you know, the whole truth or completely accurate, but that's at least how I understand Steiner's invitation. And also at, at this text as a kind of extension and application of what he sets forth in the philosophy of freedom, which we explored two cycles ago, um, and, and where he's really inviting the reader into a realization of the continuum of thought and perception. So it's to realize that what we perceive is always already, and this is a Kantian insight, of course, I guess you could say it's also platonic um, if we want to go back even further, but that everything we perceive is already permeated by thought um, and that we can become, which is something we're usually unconscious of, but there is what he describes uh, as uh, there is this, potential exceptional state where we become conscious of uh, or we, where we think about thinking and we can bring that into our everyday uh, experience and potentially expand perception. And, and this leads him in the philosophy of freedom to, in one of the uh, addendums, uh, to comment on like his expansion of the term perception or of the term percept. And I think it's very relevant uh, just in consideration of this text. 
and in consideration of language as being a conduit for uh, us to participate in spiritual reality. So in the 1918 edition of the Philosophy of Freedom, Steiner says, the idea of percept developed in this book is not to be confused with the idea of external percept, which is but a special instance of it. Rather, percept, percept here is taken to be everything that approaches man or the human being through through the senses or or through the spirit before it has been grasped by the actively elaborated concept. Senses, as we ordinarily understand the term, are not necessary in order to have percepts in soul or spirit experience. Such an extension of the meaning of percept is absolutely necessary, he says, if we are not to be prevented by the current sense of a word from enlarging our knowledge in certain fields. Anyone who uses perception to mean only sense perception will never arrive at a concept fit for the purposes of knowledge. So, so those are some thoughts uh, to enter into this text with, um, and maybe to think about what, what, at least as he understood what he was inviting us into as a kind of vicarious perception of um, clairvoyant research. Yeah. Matt, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Ashton. Um, just some brief amplifications of some comments Steiner makes about how to approach this book. Those who've already decided that human knowledge has fixed limits will be unable to appreciate what he's doing. But even those of us open to cultivating organs of perception like imagination, inspiration, and, and intuition uh, will find initially that these are, um, are fragile uh, at first. Um, <clears throat> what were his exact words here? Um, Spiritual cognition is a delicate and tender process in the human soul, he says. But I think in doing this research together and trying to uh, hear the inspirations in the images that Steiner will be conveying to us, um, we together can begin to do peer review, basically. And that's an essential part of any scientific process, natural or spiritual. And so I think that's all that I wanted to emphasize as we get started here. Um, given that there are so many of us today, instead of trying to go through the entire list to do introductions, I would invite anyone who wants to uh, share a thought uh, or an intention as we get started here to also introduce yourself. Um, tell us where you are and uh, a bit about your relationship to this text and to anthroposophy more generally, if you'd like. Uh, and any other little details you'd like to share, but um, let's try to be cognizant of the time. We're meeting for an hour uh, each Tuesday morning here, and so we want to make sure everyone who does want to chime in has a chance to do so. So I'll pause there and uh, open the floor to anyone who wants to introduce themselves and share some thoughts. I can start off. Uh, that's all right. I know I just jumped in. I couldn't find the hand raise button. My name no is Max. Uh, I'm up in Alaska. Um, I know Matt and Ashvin from, uh, excuse, excuse me, Ashton. I, forgive me. I have another friend named Ashvin. I just spoke with him yesterday uh, from CIAS, California. Um, Matt was uh, a friend and also on my um, my dissertation committee. committee. I wrote, uh, my dissertation was actually on Steiner and Steiner's epistemology and its relation to uh, Goethe's view of science. Um, that's all I'll say by way of introduction. I, uh, I just wanted to, um, to share like a, a kind of uh, attitude that's helped me approach the Steiner's, um, Steiner, the propositions that Steiner sets forth um, and in, in a way that, that sets aside some of the, the conflict that, that we might ordinarily feel with what seems to be like, or what appears anyway as sort of settled scientific view about what kind of place the world actually is. And um, I would like to just build off of Ashton's comment about the, the macroscope. 
And like one of the fundamental methods of science is analysis, like dividing things into parts. Um, and the method obviously is useful and leads to certain results, but just like any method or like any tool, uh, it's good for some jobs and not for other jobs. Um, there, there will be limits to what you can understand by taking things apart. And I think Steiner is offering a view, like kind of building on some of the attitudes that Goethe introduced to science, which has more to do with trying to grasp the holes of things. Um, not merely the parts. And in order to do that, we, we can't do that outside of thought. And as modern people, and there, you know, this, this is like a intriguing topic in itself, but as modern people, we tend to think of thoughts as something that are inside of our heads. Uh, but as Ashton already indicated, um, that's not, that hasn't always been the view. And there's nothing that indicates that that will always uh, be the view into the future. Um, certainly for ancient thinkers um, through the Middle Ages, probably. Uh, I'll just take the terminology that Aristotle gives us when he talks about like form and matter or uh, morphe and hyle or like eidos and, and um, hyle, I guess. Uh, he's, talking about, he's talking about thought as an idea um, or a form as an idea but also form as something that's that's not just an idea in our heads, but also an idea that's a sort of con constitutive, um, constitutive and ordering element of a phenomenon itself. Uh, it's not just an accident how the atoms in a plant arrange themselves, for instance. They are uh, they're manifesting some uh, some wholeness that uh, comes to sensory appearance through the you know atoms, uh, the the stuff of science. But, um, but is actually being ordered by something that is outside of the purview of, of at least kind of analytic or material science. Um, so Steiner is, uh, you know, uh, applying that way of thought actually to like higher order holes in terms of cosmos and its development through time. I'll stop there, but, but I hope somebody can, I hope something that I said will be helpful. Thank you, Leaf. And yeah, please just chime in, um, unmute yourselves and, and share your thoughts. No need to raise hands or wait to be called on. I would like to introduce myself. Hi, my name's Laura and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I met Ashton at the Nature Institute in Ghent, New York, um, where we did a foundation uh, year I think a little more than a year uh, of Gertian science. And um, yeah, so my relationship to the text, I, I've read this text before with others and on my own. Um, and since then, uh, you know, was told that it was one of the foundational books and so took that to heart. And um, since then have read uh, numerous other lectures and um, was pointed to other scientists by um, Rudolf Steiner. Basically, he was kind of my guide into um, checking out some of his um, some of his contemporaries that may may or may not have criticized what he had to say. But so after doing that for a number of years now, my first um, introduction to the text was probably over seven years ago. But after doing that, um, I'm I'm very interested in coming back around to it again. Uh, and um, in doing it with others who uh, can share some of their own inquiries into like inquiries into into um, what was what was brought forward as scientific thought then and um, something that really struck me when I was going through the prefaces is something to think about was um, where Steiner says that. In the 1913 preface, he says, uh, many, many things will be put forward, which in our time, um, and he says a couple, and, and I have dot, 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 in, uh, are inaccessible to man's intelligence. And um, I think he's talking about se sense-bound intelligence at, at this point. But I just wondered if uh, I would just made me think of, are we more? Or, or are things more or less accessible to us now? Like, has our capacity um, through evolution grown to be more capable of um, accessing some of these ideas that he's put forward 
or because of sort of the drowning out of, of our, of pure thought, of living thought, are they, are they less accessible to us now? And I'd like to think that um, we're more capable of, of the thought that's necessary to approach super sensible reality just sheerly through um, through the process of evolution, and that uh, everything that he says is just as pertinent, if not more so now. So, yeah. Hi. Just to build on what Laura said um, and Max, um, my name is Andrew Sullivan. I know Ashton and Matt from CIIS as well. Um, for the past year, I've been putting off my dissertation. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get to it eventually. I'm also a Waldorf teacher for many years and was a Waldorf student uh, going way back. So I've been studying Steiner for a, for a long time. But what came to mind in what you were saying, Laura, was I, when I was thinking of these prefaces, um, I thought of this distinction that Barfield, Owen Barfield makes between dashboard knowledge and engine knowledge. He talks more about dashboard, but I was thinking... Like we live in a time when multiple check engine lights are coming on um, and we, we can't like we can't fix the engine by tinkering with the dashboard. And I feel like I, so I'd agree that I think we're at a time when we're realizing the limits of this analytical scientific method. And I think uh, um, this extended view of what science could be, I think, um, offers options that that are just imperative if we're going to begin to deal with the the incredible issues, the poly crisis or, you know, meta crisis or whatever you want to call it. So I think that's a great metaphor that, you know, total Barfield beauty um, that, that's so evocative of, I think, this distinction that Steiner's trying to make in the prefaces. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm in Sacramento, California, just to give where I am. Well, I can go next if that's okay. So my name is Carsten and I, I'm, I live in Denmark. It's around six o'clock in the evening here. Uh, just returned from work. I'm a computer scientist and um, teach in the high school, teach math and, and computer science in high school. and. Um, have a deep interest in, in philosophy and spiritual science of all different kinds. Uh, my knowledge about Steiner is kind of limited to the books that has been read by this group. So uh, before I entered the group, I followed the group on YouTube and I read Riddles of Philosophy and the uh, Philosophy of Freedom, uh, which I, I, I actually, I've read Philosophy of Freedom a number of times. Uh, so that's the one book I knew uh, from Steiner's hand. And then uh, also I followed um, this next book about astronomy. Uh, I think one thing that is interesting in this book, in the preface, so I haven't read this book before, but one thing that is interesting is that, um, as I understand Steiner, we are limited in our access to spiritual knowledge um, due to our limited perceptive faculties, but also I think it's interesting that there's a limitation of language that Stan is talking about the difficult, I mean, this is some kind of empirical science in the sense that he's describing experiences and he makes, he, he kind of underlines that, that these are his, he's kind of experienced or have these uh, personal insights, but there are problems related to I mean, these are experiences or insights that do not easily lend themselves to language. So, so, so he he explains how he used language from different traditions, and he has to underline that what he's producing here is not simply a rehash of some something that somebody else has said on another time. Um, so, I, I yeah, so I think there's there's something to think about here that. We're not only limited by uh, limited perceptual faculties, but also by a lack of language to address these things, even if we could perceive them. Uh, 
so so my name is Mark. Um, I'm in San Francisco. And um, one of the things that really jumped out at me uh, rereading these prefaces after a number of years um, was on the one hand, um, the delicacy of the experience that Matt referred to. And I think that reading the texts um, induce some of that delicacy. Um, and then the second part, um, primarily in terms of the 1909 uh, preface, is just the um, sort of the, the calm collectedness with which Steiner announces that he he's going to be confronted by these misunderstandings, these criticisms, um, these prejudices. And then, I mean, to, to me, just this amazing openness of mind through which he then engages the, the critical positions, finds um, some commonality with um, the opposition, and yet holds to his view. Um, as, as I was reading that, um, I was reminded that in a way, the, the encounter with the book, it induces that experience of delicate insight. And at least for me, shortly thereafter, all of the objections um, rose up within me, right? So it's like, it, it sort of put me in this split position. This is many years ago, where um, there is an affirmation of the insight and a growing realization of just how much um, conceptual prejudice um, was coming through me and how uncertain I was uh, about being able to sort of hold these views openly, let's say with with family and friends. So it, it, it sort of set a challenge to me that he was able to, you know, knowingly take the risk, publish the book, understand that he was going to be uh, slandered, um, attacked, uh, misunderstood, and yet he he was able to hold to it. So anyway, thanks. Hi, um, I'm Bart. Uh, <clears throat> I am. Um, I live in Massachusetts uh, near Boston. I have. Uh, I'm a carpenter. I've been kind of reading Steiner stuff for over 15 years. Um, I just uh, just wanted to mention. You know, Laura, I had the same thought that you had kind of wondering, you know, a hundred years later, you know, is this, is this more accessible to us or is it more difficult um, to kind of access these things that Stein is talking about? And, you know, my feeling is that you know, in some ways, like the atmosphere, the kind of world that we live in, kind of the datification of um, all the type of information that's available to us uh, and just kind of the, you know, the reduction of the world to data points feels to me like that trajectory that we're on now kind of makes it more difficult in a sense. Um, but I also kind of on the other side of that feel like, um, the path to me, the path feels like it is maybe a little more, um, a little more accessible uh, with, I don't know, with a little bit of patience. Hey, 
everybody. Uh, my name's Sam. I am tuning in from Oakland, California. I also uh, have a background at CIS, which is how I know Matt and Ashton. Um, it's interesting. I, I went through CIS. I kind of brushed shoulders with Steiner a little bit, but never really got drawn into his corpus, which I found kind of daunting. And just for whatever reason, it just wasn't um, part of my unfoldment there. However, more recently, I've been doing certain kinds of practice, particularly imaginal practices that kind of involve cult cultivating subtle senses and starting actually with kind of going into the subtle body and have had experiences through that that have unexpectedly called me toward uh, Steiner and finding things that have certain kinds of correspondence there. Um, I've already kind of read a few chapters into this uh, introduction to occult science. And yeah, I'm really curious what's going to unfold here, but something I'm kind of considering, you know, I, I did take in Barfield deeply um, during my studies and later Gebzer, who's also kind of articulating uh, transparency of the spiritual, as he would put it. But Something, uh, I'm wondering if this is maybe something more in the Western disposition where there's a, a kind of way of coming at it. I'm I'm a little curious, I guess, the way that these these forms of perception, right, kind of accessing these, uh, what do we want to say, non-physical percepts, um, also, and, and the kinds of thinking involved being a certain form of embodied activity. So maybe, you know, we have an etheric body, an astral body according to these views. And if there uh, is an equally crucial way uh, of approaching that by attending to those bodies in a certain way, kind of waking up the sensory experience of those bodies as a, a way of meeting those perceptions. And I'm, I'm curious how that might come in and, and Steiner or maybe be underemphasized because I've seen it uh, potentially underemphasized in other thinkers as well. And I'm... Hmm. Yeah, just holding these questions open with a lot of a lot of curiosity. So that's something I'm I'm bringing in here. Uh, yeah, I, I may have to leave a little bit early for the first uh, couple of sessions, few sessions or so. But excited to kind of jump in and get this rolling. So nice to meet all of you. Well, I can also say something. Uh, I'm, I'm Rick. I live in the Netherlands, close to Amsterdam. I work in the university. I, I went to Waldorf School. And my parents worked at the Institute for uh, Mentally Handicapped People. So Steiner uh, founded these kind of institutes. And, uh, well, I've been reading Steiner since years. And uh, interesting to join you guys so uh, thanks for organizing and let's see what uh, what this uh, what this brings so that's all i got for now nice to meet you hello everybody i am i'm lorenzo i I live in Turin, Italy, and um, well, I was already in the other groups. I uh, I've been reading Steiner for some years now. This was the first book by him I ever read, and it's now almost twenty years. And I I would like to um, uh, add something build on what uh, Carson said about language. I was uh, interested by uh, something Steiner says in uh, in the last, of the first preface, the, the, the preface of uh, 1925. And he says, yeah, that um, as Carsten already mentioned, that he, uh, he claims not to um, uh, to have been uh, 
really influenced or any way not to be um, uh, arguing for traditional knowledge, but that even if he knows, he has read uh, about traditions from India, from whatever, he is not influenced by them. And, and this is very striking. I mean, it's something that uh, might, you know, make you raise an eyebrow because you say, how how can you claim something like that? But he, he then gets a little more specific and uh, he says that um, he always knew how to uh, delete what he had read first and he he managed to delete, or at least I am I'm now translating into English what I'm reading in the Italian translation. I don't know if the words are the same in your edition. Anyway, and he managed to to delete what he had read. And how how can he delete what he read? Well, because all of the terms, and he's not speaking about generally about life. He's speaking about um, determinate subjects sub philosophical or spiritual subjects that have um a finite amount of uh, um of terms of technical terms he says that he took those terms and he um reworked their definitions through his experience and uh, his reasoning so that the definition of each of the terms of the determinate field was, let's say, written by him or consciously uh, reworked by him so much that it was fully his. And when you do that, he implicitly claims, then you are able to delete the outside influence. And I think this is not something that the Steiner really... Uh, explores uh, in, in in the rest of the book or in uh, what what I know I mean not not at least it doesn't go really into the linguistic aspect of semantics or also because linguistic was was just uh, was not not born yet at, in his times but um I think it's very interesting and uh, it goes quite against our consensus uh, understanding of uh, uh, of what makes up our um, uh, our tools uh, that we use to create, uh, even if unconsciously, our representations, and the fact that you can draw a line between you and the rest of the thinkers of that specific language that you were raised in and you think in, in is something that is both very practical. I mean, I think every every one of us has a, a feeling for this. When you learn a, a subject, you, you create your own uh, um, understanding of the definitions. But when you really specialize regarding a determinate subject, However small it is, maybe if it's smaller, it's it's more practical. It's something that we we know better. When we we are specialized, then we refuse, you know, the the consensus we have. We our own understanding, our own reading, and the more our definitions of the fundamental terms um, are uh, our own work created by our own reflection, the more that subject becomes plastic and uh i think this could be said uh, uh about even larger uh sets like maybe about the whole of reality but that's something that goes maybe it is too far from our uh usual perception because it's very unusual you know to to have a definition of chair or table that has it, you completely worked out by your own. But if we think about specific subjects that we care about and how our relationship with those subjects has changed during our learning and reflection, I think this can be felt by everybody. I think this is very, very interesting. 
Thank you. Good evening, uh, Angus, uh, part of the European crowd with uh, Lorenzo and uh, Rick and uh, Carsten. Nice to be here again. Um, this is my fourth outing. Um, yeah, and uh, just to repeat what Matt said right at the beginning, these are can be amazing journeys of uh, discovering discovery, um, amazing processes of uh, deepening um i'm going to focus on a little bit that steiner says at the end of uh, at chapter one and connect it with a couple of the things the thoughts so like just as introductory thoughts to what uh, what might unfold so he says uh the author will be describing what he believes himself uh, to know about the being of man including what man undergoes in birth and death and in the body free condition in the spiritual world, also about the evolution of the earth and of mankind. It might then seem as though he were putting forward all these alleged items of knowledge as dogmas, which the reader was being asked to accept on the writer's authority. But it is not so. He's inviting us, one way of understanding it is to, to play a game with him learn to see the world through it's like the conceptual lenses that uh, that he's building up um and uh jeff who might introduce himself later we're currently doing a book on christianity as mystical fact but um one of the things that might become clear as we get especially to uh it's like the, the planet for your illusions is connections with so like aspects from uh revelations of the bible the apocalypse this goes deep. Uh, another area, the, if anybody's so like familiar or interested in so like the world of so like scholasticism, what it was trying to achieve, you're going to find a lot of interesting concepts to um, to to play with there. And so I'm I'm really looking to ex forward to uh, exploring this uh, this work together because it is. Um, Dante uses this term uh, convivio. It's the idea of a banquet. You go to a, you go to a, you 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 you, 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 like you serve something up on the table, and you let people sort of like partake of it if they want to. It's, everything is here by uh, by free choice, and that's the way I see Steiner expressing his offering here, saying, "Don't you don't have to believe me. That's not a prerequisite, but do yourself a favor." play with these ideas and you might well find that they enrich your world in ways that you weren't capable of imagining um, before so welcome to you all Hi everyone, and good evening. I'm Alex, um, living in Sweden, in Järna, where there is um, you know, quite quite a large anthroposophical uh, context and initiatives since the mid fifties. I've been here for about fifteen years, so how I've been acquainted or got acquainted with Anthroposophy and Steiner's work and I'm happy to join for another series of studies with this uh, yeah, great group that we've been having and it's nice to see a lot of people here um, so one thing that I was thinking about when reading 
uh, these prefaces. I'm yeah, I'm quite I'm a bit acquainted with Goethean science, and it feel it felt to me that Steiner in in one of the prefaces was making the point of um, this this difference between how in Goethean science there's still the physical or natural world that is a percept that is being used to to get knowledge deeper knowledge of the natural world uh, and and a super sensible knowledge opposed to I don't know if that would be what he calls occult science but a science that is based purely on a spiritual percept um at least well that's that's what i felt he was making a point here and um so yeah i think that would that's one aspect i think would be interesting to see if that that difference becomes more clear i think that's at least for me but i think for many people that's what becomes difficult with steiner is to approach his um his yeah purely spiritual research so how do we approach that with our own current um senses whether they're more or less exercised so to speak and and personally as well regarding the recent studies that we've had uh and discussions i think that will also be interesting to 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 go deeper into the themes of occult science well i'll say a little bit about what i'm thinking uh, as we get into this book um my name is Jeff, that, uh, that's the being, I'm, I'm the other Jeff, Angus uh, referred to the other Jeff in studying the Christianity as mystical fact. Um, it's a good name, so, so uh, we're part of a good club here. Um, yeah, what I'm thinking about uh, of the prefaces and probably, uh, you know, I'm gonna draw a little bit on chapter one, sort of continuing the same theme, this really big idea, and a bunch of people have said this in various ways, This this line uh, you know, Steiner is trying to define between natural science and spiritual science, you know, and of course all the, the criticism he gets, uh, you know, you know, we, we cannot know those things that you you claim to know and you all the, all these ideas of where the limits of knowledge are. Um, from well, one, one of my perspectives in going into that is that, and Steiner says this in so many words, is that the spiritual scientist you cannot do the same thing as the natural scientists as far as being um, you know, not personally at, uh, attached to their object of study, right? They can look at the external world in a so-called objective way, but the, the spiritual scientist really has to um, go very deeply into their own person, into their own inner world as far as their their whole method of study, right? So you you can't you can't be detached and you know, the, the, the so-called objective stance of, of natural science that, oh yeah, we don't interfere with the world, you know, we, we, we barely touch it as we observe it and whatever those ideas are supposed to be. Um, so I'm thinking about all this, and again, Steiner says this in so many words, but there's a kind of a, a, almost like a, a beginning of, of spiritual initiation, you know, uh, to go into to spiritual science. Like you can't, you, you again, you can't be detached. You can't not change in the process. You know, you uh, and as somebody said earlier this morning, you know, you you are you the human organism. You are the instrument of science. So, anyways, I'm thinking of all these things and rooting it back to my world and and my broader area of thinking, which is around the philosophy of of medicine, the philosophy of healthcare, and how even you know the the most 
basic things that people do to start changing their health. You know, people eat better and you know, do anything like that. Uh, uh, you know, usually unknowingly to themselves, they're actually kind of taking a step uh, onto the path of initiation. Maybe we'd call it like prep school or something like that, but it's definitely going in that direction. So these are some of my reflections on uh, where we've started so far in this book. And he's, he's and I, I read this, this is one of the very first Steiner books I read many years ago, and I'm rereading it now. I recognize and remember what I've read before, but I also simultaneously recognize how different my perception is reading it now than reading it 20 plus years ago where I you know, I knew nothing. I knew nothing of anthroposophy or any of these ideas. So I was really kind of green at that time and sort of kind of a, a lesser a lesser shade of green at this point, if we could so call it that. Thanks, Jeff. And just to plug, uh, Jeff is going to give a pop-up talk tomorrow at 9 a.m. on the integration of Steiner's work with Wilhelm Reich. So I'll post a link in the chat for those who would like to attend. Uh, maybe I can I'll go next. Um, my name is Chad. I'm uh, an archetypal astrologer. I I was an assistant to Richard Tarnas at CS um, for many years. That's where I met uh, in Ashton. And uh, I live on Maui, actually. And uh, uh, the next week, next Sunday, the time changes for the mainland, but not for here. So it'll be 6 a.m. on every Tuesday. So maybe that's a little public service announcement to the Europeans, which I don't. I'm not sure if you guys' time changes next week or not. But um, And just a quick comment on what you just said, Jeff, as far as... Um, scientists you know thinking that they kind of have an observational position and don't actually touch the world um they only created the atomic bomb and um brought about the anthropocene on some level um, so it's 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 a deeply participatory relationship even as scientists whether they recognize it or not um but uh, just a quick comment i was part of the previous reading groups and um last group was the interdisciplinary um, astronomy course, which I found really rewarding. And um, I think maybe just a quick comment on how I see um, archetypal astrology as basically an instantiation of logos, um, both in the Heraclitian sense of an ordering principle, and but also in the Christian sense of uh, the word as the language, as the word of the divine. And uh, it can help us move into that relationship. And I think Steiner's work really helps us understand um, how we can more um, cultivate that participatory relationship with the symbolic essence of what are ultimately spiritual beings, uh, the archetypes as, as, as I see them. And um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to the group and uh, meeting everyone. So yeah, thank you. Um, I might have at it here. Hey, folks. Um, it's been uh, a great trip with this group, and I think the work that we've done up to this point really leads us to this, to these prefaces, even, I would say. And uh, um, very impressed, very moved by the 1925 preface. I don't think I've really read it. Like, uh, if I've read this book a couple of times, I've skipped over the prefaces, probably, because that's my nature. Um, but, uh, in it, Steiner says something that I don't think I've ever read him say, or heard him say through the lectures, which is that he's, he basically was working out of intuition, um, as a state of consciousness and inspiration as a state of consciousness with capital I's in those cases, and that he was presenting imaginations out of that inherent clairvoyance right um and uh i find that interesting i find it um 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 well it presents a kind of threshold doesn't it like uh how can we understand this work if we don't if we're not operating with um um those those levels of clairvoyance perceiving those ontological realms out of which then these images are brought. Um, and um, going to the question of whether or not we are more 
mm, permeable in our perception now than than perhaps previous in previous times. We we've, we've certainly been through something with the twentieth century, um, and we're kind of putting ourselves through a lot now. So it's hard to say that that's not a, a bit of an initiatory process in and of itself. It seems to me that in this space, this internet space, where there's a lot of people exploring themes um, in the face of the meaning crisis and the poly crisis and the sense making crisis, that that this idea of the imaginal is is coming back to the if if it ever was there, coming to a mainstream. Um, theater and hear you right and it's it 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 seems to be playing out and it seems to me this book can speak because of the way in which uh the imag the way the way in which the pictures are brought in an in a truly imaginal way to that liminal space that i think that we're all in or many of us find ourselves in and perceive each other to be in and uh so i, I would just say that um the other thing he says here is an epistemological statement that he makes in this, I believe it's in the same preface, which is that if your emotionally tinged concepts uh, are going to be brought to bear on this material, then you're not going to understand it. But all it takes is an unprejudiced, um, unpresumptive epistemological approach and perhaps practice to allow the material to reveal itself on a level that may not be intuitive or it may not be inspirational, but it's certainly borderline imaginal. Uh, and I find that extraordinarily encouraging, not just for myself and my uh, neophyte hood, but also uh, how much energy is being put into these concepts in our, in our shared space with people around us. I'm Jeff, by the way, I'm in Saxpaha, North Carolina long time anthropop I'm a I'm a long time anthroposophist but I didn't I found this group because I was following Matt Siegel on Meta Modern Spirituality Facebook group which is a bunch of contemporary academics probably closely allied to the spiritual stream that we're interested in cultivating. And I didn't, and then I was in a study group reading Whitehead and um, with the Cobb Institute and Matt came in as a guest speaker at the end. And then lo and behold, I started observing Matt referring to Rudolf Steiner and I, I had no idea that he was a student of Steiner at that point. So um, on Twitter last year, I saw his invitation to the new Earth Phenomenon study group, and that's why I joined. So on this page, I have an old friend, Laura. Um, we worked in the same Waldorf school, <laughs> and uh, my friends, John and Roxana, I met through online internet studies. I'm so pleased to be aware of the Earth Phenomena, what you know, Substack website, it's just so full of energetic, like-minded people on the path of spiritual growth. So I'm looking forward to what we could do together with um, this classic book of Rudolf Steiner. Thank you. My name is James Kaplan. I come, I don't know anybody. I come through this through a logarithm, but I got one day watching YouTube. And basically I was in finance all my life. I come from a financial bank. I live outside of Pittsburgh, PA, which I live in Newcastle, about an hour north. And came about this because, well, I was laid off and seemed kind of desperate at the time. Then COVID hit. And then next thing you know, blessings. All these blessings came to me. And I was like, what's going on? This world's completely burning and I'm not. And basically, 
I found this study group uh, under the riddles of philosophy, which opened my eyes that stuff. I come from it. I'm not anthroposophical. I'm basically a Roman Catholic, and I come up through a Catholic eyes. And I found that my Christianity, my Catholicism has basically been enriched way above what I could ever thought. So I want to introduce myself. I'm James Kaplan from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and I look forward to working with you people. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Buckley from uh, Vancouver. Uh, the algorithm gods uh, set me on footnotes to Plato, and I fall asleep to that many nights. Sorry, Matt. Um, I, I've had kind of a, over the last few years a bit of a dark night of the soul, which is kind of funneling me into this kind of information. And I'm quite interested in um, how our you know, let's say Steiner, Steiner's um, scaffolding or understanding of the cosmos interacts with with trauma and how we can, how that understanding could maybe help us transcend our own global and personal traumas. So thank you, everybody. Anybody else who wants to? I'll just say a word. Yes, please. Thanks. Hi, I'm John, and we're from Romania. Um, my background is in curative education and social therapy. I've been working, been here some 30 years in Romania, but before that, I was in Campio centers in Switzerland and Scotland. Um, I, my interest here was uh, particularly through anthroposophy, which I've known for a long time. So it's a long time since I read this book, and I was very glad to get back into it. Uh, I think also for me, it was the first time I've read the prefaces, and I found that a, a, a fundamental um, recapitulation of Rudolf Steiner's um, methodology. And I found that very helpful. Uh, but I would like also to take the moment to the, to excuse a, another friend who should have joined us tonight, Graham Calderwood, but he's unwell and can't participate. But And he will come, I hope, next week and also introduce himself mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. I have to leave. See you in a week. Okay. Bye. So we're at the top of the hour here. And if you didn't get a chance to chime in or introduce yourselves today, please feel free to do so next week. Um, if you can't make every meeting, that's okay. Come back next time or whenever you can drop in. We're going to be aiming to read about 20 pages per session. But, you know, many of you have read this book before. You might not be able to resist reading ahead a bit. That's fine. We don't need to be overly strict about what you can bring up or reference in any given meeting. But just so we're relatively on the same page, we're aiming for about 20 pages. Um, I want to just leave us with the thought about um, what Laura brought up earlier, whether it's more difficult or, uh, or not to approach the perspectives that Steiner is revealing to us here um, in our time than it was 100 years ago. And I think, you know, what has shifted over the course of the last few thousand years of, of human evolution is an increasing opportunity for freedom we're all here out of our own freedom to study these ideas. 
This isn't a for credit school. This isn't uh, to get some certificate. This is just because we as striving human beings want to understand ourselves and the world more deeply together. And so, you know, freedom is both a tremendous opportunity, but it's also what has required that we become untethered from the spiritual world. Untethered from that kind of original participation, as Barfield would put it, where the meaning of the world was directly perceived all around us. The world thought itself in us. And now we're not in that situation anymore. And so in that sense, it's more difficult. But in another sense, we have the opportunity to re-engage with the spiritual world on purpose, out of our own freedom, as individuals who come not only back to the spiritual world out of their own freedom, but back into communion with other individuals in pursuit of a, a new kind of insight that does require going inward and dealing with our particularities, but Steiner wants us to be able to move through what nowadays we might call our own psychology, right? To get to something spiritual where we go deep enough inward that we, that we come to something common again, that we all share, but that is initially delicate and more difficult to become scientific about because it's not disconnected from our own will anymore. We're not just engaging in intellectual exercises where we're, you know, proving some geometrical theorem or um, tracing logical deductions or weighing something on a scale, right? We're trying to discover a different kind of objectivity, spiritual objectivity, spiritual science. And, you know, that's uh, initially, again, a delicate inner flower that we are trying to water and allow to blossom. And so um, I'm really honored and, and grateful for everyone's desire to, to participate in this effort together. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Do you want to add anything, Ashton? Or uh, I mean, just, to, just, I guess, to add to that, you know, um, I think it was Bart, I can't remember exactly who said this, but uh, who, who was describing the world today as being reduced to data points and, you know, in connection with Laura's question about like, is it harder? Or is it easier? Um, and I think with the world being reduced to data points, there's also what you were speaking to, Matt, and what Laura also spoke to in the chat, this yearning um, and this, this like, this like growing feeling of the lack and and like that awareness of the lack i think is is a big reason maybe why um there is an increased possibility for um growing back into uh an experience of the world's speaking so anyway yeah thanks so much for joining us really looking forward to the weeks ahead and yeah if y'all can make it see you tomorrow Otherwise, see you next week. Don't forget about the time change if you're in Europe. <laughs> see you all next Tuesday or tomorrow for Jeff Corntair's pop-up. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.